All right, so dear guests and listeners, welcome to the Awesome Algo episode number seven. This is a very special one for myself and for my guest today, because this episode is essentially fully dedicated to the history of the project called Algo World, which was one of the things that sparkled my initial interest in the Algo Rand ecosystem in general, and. Since then, we went through a very crazy journey, I would say. So the agenda for today is essentially to cover the brief history of the Algo World project that happened since April last year, and to go over the journey that we went through in regards to building and open sourcing the platforms that we built under the Algo World brand, such as the Asset Explorer and the Swapper. And my guest today is Matthew Dardell, and he is one of the original creators of the Algo World project, which started as a collection of non-fungible tokens representing different cities and countries around the world. And we will start with the biography, as it usually given to the episodes of the Awesome Algo, and then we will dive deep into the history of Algo World. And in regards to how it's going to be structured, so... Just to give a heads up, this is a live episode, so we're streaming this. If you're watching the stream at the moment and would like to leave any questions for a short uh, Ask Me Anything section at the end, you can ask it to myself or Matt, and uh, we will get back to you by reviewing your question on our Telegram community channel. And the structure for each question is basically going to be a bit more casual. Matt is going to be covering the sort of the historical aspects of different features that we were adding to the algo world as the time went on and i will be trying to fill in the gaps in regards to specific implementation details so with that in mind once again algo world sorry the awesome algo podcast is maintained on my free time this is something i do pure out of passion and i try to highlight different guests in the Algorand ecosystem who are building amazing tools or just generally contributing some something interesting towards the adoption of the Algorand ecosystem. And with that in mind, Matt, the floor is yours. Let's start with uh, the biography. I would really to, I guess, start by the introduction from yourself and maybe you could start with the academic background and the decision making mm-hmm behind choosing the domain of engineering because an interesting detail about math is that it's not necessarily computer science right yes it's it's a very different field of engineering and the path you made towards actually looking into all grant is quite interesting so yeah the stage is yours thank you yeah first of all thank you all for inviting me to to this episode of awesome algo i'm very glad to to be in this episode and to be able to talk about Algo World. So yes, as you said, we can start with my biography. So I'm Matt, I'm 35 years old. I'm from France and I work in the aeronautics industry as a project manager in the system engineering field. So not the computer science field, as you said. So yeah, I started with studies in an engineering school and it was more about mathematics, physics and uh, automation and not so much about um, programming languages even if I learned that that as well and uh, yeah so um, I've studied some different languages but mainly some engineering uh, languages like uh, MATLAB. I don't know if MATLAB, but it's very popular among uh, engineers, and uh, I think it's not a very good tool for a, a software engineer. But uh, for what we do, it's pretty good. Oh, yeah, it certainly has its own domain, right? It's uh, mm. 
electrical engineering, automation yeah. and control and simulation of different uh, math models. Exactly, it's, yeah. it's very useful for that. And uh, th 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 this is also reminding me uh, a lot on the biography of Cosimo from oh. the first episode, because I believe nice. he also started as uh, an electrical engineer initially. Mm -hmm. so, the, the way he explains, for example, <clears throat> Teal and uh, how the algorithm uh, virtual machine works oh, is, yeah. is very interesting to see because he's uh, giving a lot of analogies to electrical engineering world and mm -hmm. physics. So it's, uh, yeah, sorry for a detour. Please uh, go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, at first when I began to work in my company, I manipulated and I worked a lot with MATLAB. But uh, apart from that, coding is more like a hobby to me. And yes, know that I... I mean, project management, I don't usually uh, code in work anymore. And um, yeah, I, I have some basic skills in programming. And so, yeah, to make it short, I know MATLAB, Python, and that's pretty much it. Um, yes, that's it for my biography. And I think I can continue with how I discovered Algorand and the blockchain in general. Yeah, I guess we could start um, with... Uh, let's go from the highest uh, sort of... Uh, from the biggest domain and then trim it down to specifically Algorand ecosystem. Yeah. So I guess uh, what was your first introduction to just blockchain in general, then yeah, the first sure. introduction to Web3 in general, and then of course, meeting with the Algorand and the Algorand ecosystem. Yeah, sure. So um, I had been turning around crypto and blockchain for a while, but I hadn't really dived in it until the start of 2021, actually. So um, I've been interested in, in Ethereum first because I had heard about their plan to migrate to proof of stake protocol and well the, the biggest thing that withdrew me from crypto since then was uh, was proof of work protocol and the, the fact that to me it was like a big waste to to spend so much energy to run blockchains like bitcoin that's some personal opinion but I didn't like that aspect. And when I learned about Ethereum and their plans to migrate to proof of stake, then I got interested in that and I started to invest and to learn more about this. And I got interested in a lot with, with smart contracts, Web3 and all the possibilities that were offered by Ethereum and that you didn't really had with Bitcoin. Yes, my first experience in blockchains um, was with Ethereum. I, I didn't go very deep with it. I, I just invested at the time. And after that, I learned about Cardano because I was like, Ethereum is great because it's migrating to proof of stake and it will, it will be eco-friendly and all that stuff. And then I discovered Cardano, and it was already proof of stake. So I was like, well, great. I will go to Cardano. And, and then I also discovered Algorand, and it looked like um, very efficient, and fast, and cheap, easy to use. So, um, well, step by step, I, I went to Algorand. And uh, I found it very appealing and very interesting. So I um, I kind of stuck with it after afterwards. And maybe just to dig a, a little bit deeper into it, but what would you say the most interesting features that sort of sparked your interest? In the Did you start at looking into the sort of research and comparison on different uh, consensus mechanisms 
in mind for mm -hmm. creating Algo World project, or was this something that actually followed this this phase when you were just essentially mm -hmm. trying to explore which consensus in general you think are more energy efficient and uh, let's say more scalable? Mm -hmm. Sure, the consensus of algorithm looked very good and interesting, but the most interesting part was the possibility for me to build an algorithm thanks to the compatibility with Python, because mm -hmm. uh, you can build an algorithm using JavaScript or Python. In my case, it was Python that interested me. And uh, by the time I had the idea of AlgoWorld, I was balanced between Cardano and Algorand. But by looking at Cardano, I, I don't know um, if you want Cardano a little bit, but if you want to build on, on Cardano, it's pretty tough and it's for real software engineers, I think you have to master ask, which is a very specific language and that I didn't know. And even if I thought that AlgoWorld could be good on Cardano because it had a bigger community, mm -hmm. uh, well, it was a, a no-brainer when I saw that uh, AlgoWorld had, had this Python compatibility and, and I could build an algorithm thanks to Python because it was a language that I knew and I knew that I could build algorithm quickly and efficiently by using Python. And uh, that made my choice. I see. So basically, the main criteria were the availability in different programming languages yeah. for the SDKs to interact with the chain itself. In this case, you mm -hmm had a lot of experience with Python, so you were primarily interested with that. And then I suppose the, I guess the user experience in this case, right? Yeah. How easy it is for us to uh, set up a testnet account, mm -hmm. the exactly. testnet algo from the faucet, and then basically start minting or testing something. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I see. and I have some documentation as well, because even by that time, the algorithm website was pretty oriented to helping developers to to build an algorithm and there were some information about mining nfts and mm -hmm. some examples of uh, of scripts so it was very helpful and i knew that i would be able to, to build easily on an algorithm Plus, there was like the opportunity to be one of the first NFT series, consistent series and algorithm. And even if the community was smaller, uh, I thought that it would be interesting to be the first and uh, to have this first mover advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that's how it started. And I had the idea of going as fast as I could to have this advantage of first movers. Mm -hmm. um, that was pretty exciting at the time. Um, I spent two or three weeks really, really interesting and exciting because I was doing like only this. And I had my job, but when I was, <laughs> I was going home at night and on the weekends, I was building as fast as I could um, to be the first one um, to propose a um, and then FT, yeah, uh, oh man, I can imagine like the amount of yeah, the, the initial set was something around a thousand and five hundred images, each yeah. representing different sort of countries. And you had to also find the assets, right? Find the royalty free assets for it and generate, mm -hmm. mint each of those, and etc. But before we go ahead and dive into Algo World specifically, I guess just to sort of Finalize on the biography section before we dive into the specifics of, of the algorithm world itself. I guess what were the main sort of ideas behind the original creation of the project? Was it something that 
I'm just curious, was it something that you had in mind after already getting familiar with the with the chains uh, and the, I would say, like modern L1 chains available right now in the market? Mm -hmm. And have you looked at anything that perhaps Ethereum already provided as, because as you may know, I think there was also a project on Ethereum with a very similar concept back in 2017 or 2000. 16 that dealt with that but i i don't really recall what happened with that project but there was something similar on ethereum basically back 16 so i'm just curious yeah, to know on, yeah. on what are the sort of prerequisites that were inspiring you for uh, to create this thing basically yeah so um, i had this idea after discovering the blockchains and the web3 because after discovering it and seeing the different NFT products, I got interested in, in NFTs and I got interested in building something. And so I had this idea, which is not very original. And as you said, uh, there's always or already been some similar concepts before, but I didn't know at that time and I didn't to make specific research to know if something similar had been done before because I had this idea, I thought it was a good one. I knew that there were there were no NFT projects on Algorand. I went straight ahead and uh, I didn't make some research at the time so um, yes i had this idea after discovering blockchains and uh, i just thought of something simple and that would be adapted to the specificities of algorand because i thought of this collectible card games and the idea was to um, well make people discover nfts and algorithms and also be able to trade different cards between uh, each other mm -hmm. the, and it's perfect for that because there are very small fees it's fast and easy to use so my idea was also to allow people to manipulate nfts to know what it is on algorand and to be able to easily trade their cards so that was the idea behind Algorand and the facts, the fact of having collectible card game uh, on Algorand. I see, I see. So I guess uh, with that pretty much covering the the introductory section, let's dive into the interesting part now, the deep dive into Alka world in general. So to recap for the listeners out there, because we've been mentioning this name for, for a while throughout the episode basically it is a indeed a collectible card trading game so essentially there is a set of different collections representing countries and cities around the world and we'll dive into the specific incentive mechanisms that we came up with along the way as the project started developing so the goal for the upcoming discussion is for us to basically just cover everything that happened it was this little project that started, as you can hear and see, as a as a passion thing for two of us to basically play around with the Algorand blockchain. And through Algorand, we certainly learned a lot of different capabilities that Algorand L1 provides out of the box. And with that, let's uh, let's start with covering the very first months of the project's existence. <laughs> What what can you tell our listeners about that? How did the the very first setup? Yeah, sure. Um, after creating the cards and minting the fifteen hundred cards of countries, um, what I did was to just post a message on Reddit on the official. Algorand Reddit channel and saying, hi guys, I'm building an NFT project on, on Algorand, uh, which is called Algo World. And this is the concept and 
Uh, it will be ready soon, so if you want to join, uh, there will be packs of cards to for sale in a few days. And so at that point, I was like, there are two possibilities. Either nobody likes it and it's over and I won't talk about Algo World again, or it gets some interest and it will be a wild ride. So it was the second option. There, there had been some very positive feedback and a lot of reactions. And people started joining uh, the Telegram chat. So um, everything started like that. And uh, the community grew on Telegram. So um, that was really the main channel to build the community and there was twitter as well to have some communication as well and through reddit twitter and people joining the telegram it, it started the community so um, the idea at first was to sell some packs and everything was manual at that time and uh, by thinking of it now, it was crazy because everything had to be done manually. So people had to register manually, to ask for packs by sending me a message. Mm -hmm. I had to say to them which assets to opt to in. To opt in, yeah. And, then yeah. <laughs> and so after they opted in, I had to run my script to send them the right pack. And uh, yeah, everything was manual. It was crazy. Mm, uh, as I said, as you said also, there were 1,500 cards. And so um, the idea was to sell packs uh, of five cards and buy batch, batches of 50 cards, mm -hmm. uh, 50 packs, excuse me. So each time there, were, there was a sale, so um, there were 50 packs for sale and um, yeah it was a lot of messages uh, uh, a very heavy night of sending some messages and um, assets to obtain and sending some cards but it was very exciting because you could feel the energy and the, the, the excitement uh, mm -hmm. about uh, getting the nfts getting the cards and it was the first NFT experience for a lot of users. And so, yeah, it was pretty fun. So this was in April of 2021. And Oh, yes, I was just about to mention, let's also set the timeline for the listeners out there. So the yeah. April 2019, sorry, 2021 One, two, in this case. Two, so. I think by that time, Algorand has been running for a couple of years already. There's, there was already an established developer documentation out there, but the sort of that particular year was associated with a very rapid, I would say, growth on the market. A lot of different projects were rising. Uh, mm -hmm. The competition was very steep. And I think this was the beginning of a lot of DeFi projects being approved for the Algorand grants and uh, a lot of things uh, at that point haven't existed actually. Things like uh, Rank Gallery, NFT Explorer, a, a lot of those things were actually starting to be developed sometime around that time. And uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty hard actually to find a lot of resources and specifically resources about smart contracts in regards to NFTs and auctions and how to set them up and etc. Certainly was an, an interesting time to get in. I guess there, there, there were pros and cons to the fact that uh, I guess the project started relatively early uh, mm -hmm. in that particular uh, time of the year, last year. Yes, and, uh, excuse me, go ahead. 
Go ahead, sorry. Uh, the, I, I just pretty much wanted to set the timeline, basically, for, for the yeah. beginning. Yeah, I just wanted to add that in a three months time frame, a lot of things changed be, because between April and like June, there, there were different NFT projects, there were different uh, ways to look at NFTs. There, there were a lot of different things. things pretty much happened on a daily yeah. basis and the weekly yeah, basis yeah, yeah. like if you miss a week during that uh, particular time frame like it's like you're mm -hmm. missing on a month of content just so much things uh, popping up from here and there and then compliance and security was also a big thing right because it was it was, it was a rapid growth there was a lot of also uh, scammers and etc and people trying to uh, make a quick buck on things yeah. like that and uh, Certainly wasn't the safest environment, but that's a byproduct of uh, of cases when the there's a big rapid growth and in particular area in the ecosystem. So a lot and of people had to um, just deal with that. Yeah, and it's surprising that um, things started to change so fast at this time because Algorand is live on mainnet since 2019 i think mm -hmm. so during 18 months it didn't evolve or change much i think because yeah, it's, uh, a, it's an interesting remark yeah yeah, yeah. I yeah. Wonder, uh, somehow everything was just correlating that particular uh, quarter think, like um, closer to summer this has been this has been a, a big rise in uh, about the price of algorand uh, i think there's been a, a bull run uh, around the beginning of 2021 and maybe that pushed many people to to get some interest in this blockchain in particular and start building on it i don't know but the uh, fact is yeah you didn't want to be two or three weeks late because everything could change by this time, yeah. Yeah. So I guess at this point, so we, so again, backtrack and recap for the listeners, we just outlined the, the picture of how the first couple of months looked like for the project. So it was essentially a set of different community channels with the primary one being on the Telegram, and that's where the majority of fun happened. There was a lot of regular members who were actively participating in the different rants, and I was actually messing on Reddit sometime in the late April, and that's also around the time when I discovered that Algorand on the podcast, and I found Matt's post on uh, Reddit. This was actually, I think, a couple of weeks after you uh, already made the announcement. I think by the time mm -hmm. I joined, there was uh, uh, already a, a good chunk of members and uh, people actively participating. And so what I did is, uh, I think I also got a few manual packs from you. This was also my very first experience with just Algorand standard assets in general this was by doing a manual trade which is certainly against the permissionless yeah. ideology but <laughs> but uh, this is what it is if you have uh, when you start something uh, as, as a passion project right it's uh, you got to build things step by step and eventually there is there's is adoption but uh, i guess what I saw, and uh, myself coming from, I guess, the the software engineering background, and in this case, I was also coming from the place of passion. I haven't ha had experience to try blockchain development before in general. This was my first exposure to it, and I really enjoyed the state of the algorithm documentation they had back then. Right now, I think it's even more improved the... Uh, it certainly did a great job the past year, but even back last year, so this was back when they actually had a slightly different terminology on some things in regards to smart contracts. The primary entry point for myself, same as 
with UMAT was the Pi Algorand SDK and Pi Teal. Basically, I started just participating in the Algorand community, chatting with different members there, and realized that I feel like there was certainly a need for a bit more secure ways for people to transfer cards, essentially. Mm. So that's how this initial idea for Algorand Explorer came in and there was a platform and again this is something that myself and Matt were doing on, on, on our free time there was always a question of balance right you always have to balance your sort of full-time commitments with, with work and etc so I had to come up with something that was relatively easy to set up but at the same time wouldn't require a lot of dealing with web technologies in general just because i'm a bit biased towards uh, i'm not using javascript if there is a way not to use it but basically the very first iteration of algo world explorer and what algo world explorer is it was essentially a marketplace sort of with listings that was specific to the cards that Matt created. So it was something specifically dedicated for the members of the community and people were coming in there, placing their particular cards as offers and anyone can use the Alga Signer extension. So this was basically the very, very first simple iteration done in Anvil. And for the developers who are listening to this, if you're interested in some sample implementations for example i think anvil is pretty much still live it's a startup from uk they're, they're doing great they provide a platform for full stack development using python so you essentially have an interface that allows you to build your front end and then connect with a set of databases and everything happens within that platform you don't need to touch any html or javascript so it's for rapid prototyping mostly or for people who deal with data science when you need to build the visualizer so once again it was a centralized solution limited time was given for myself and i was just really messing with it i was uh, having a lot of fun i was implementing something because at the same time i would also participate in the telegram chat folks including yourself matt and different members would be giving feedback and etc and it was a real-time feedback loop when you can implement something and immediately people test it and they say what to tweak and etc and the incentive mechanism was a small fee that we were taking for for the trades to happen essentially so for each successful buy we were i don't recall in the v1 what was the amount but i think we were charging something around 2.5 percent and uh, once again it was a centralized solution I only relied on atomic transactions and I relied on Anvil as a platform. So then a lot of interesting st things started happening and I think I'll give the stage back to Matt, I think. So any chance you could cover an initial set of uh, weeks after we launched the Explorer mm -hmm. V1 and we started seeing people placing trades in the server, and I think this lasted yeah. up until June, so. Yeah, yeah, so um, first of all, this website, as simple as it was like a dream coming true, because it was beyond my skills and the fact of you being able to provide this, uh, this first mar mar marketplace on Algorand dedicated to Algo world, it was, wow, awesome. And so um, finally, the members of the community were able to play play some, some bids on, on cards to to make some trades, and so um, and purchase um, some cards from this website. So it was really exciting, and and yeah, it was the first marketplace on Algorand. So that that's fun, and. After that, yeah, people started to buy cards from the website, and there was also these notifications on the chat when a trade was performed. It created some hype, and, and people could see how much people 
spent to, to get a card. And there was also some hype around uh, diamond cards, which were rarer. And um, yeah, it, I think it boosted the project and it helped the project and to grow and to attract even more more people. So um, there's a few weeks after getting the Explorer were really exciting for the project. And uh, like I'm sure there are some folks out there who might have a beef with statements of us saying that this was the first NFT market based on Algorand, but once again, we're not trying to claim as some status or whatever this was like our claim is that i think we were one of the one of the first in the list of nft marketplaces that were specific to individual projects in the ecosystem so i'm sure mm -hmm. there you might find out something in regards to maybe there's open source things that were built or white label marketplaces that were built way before 2021 but at this stage when we were getting into this i personally haven't found anything live that would allow me to make a listing and a lot of things on chain and centralized solutions at that stage as we pointed out earlier were basically getting funding or in the early stages of already testing their platform so this was really early days in regards to any generic marketplaces so in order mm -hmm. to not compete with big folks who have big teams and have a lot of uh, the uh, investment behind them. That's why we try to narrow down the scope and focus specifically on this uh, set of collections uh, that were specific to the algo world. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess to also just to, because as I said, I want this particular episode to be really serving as a is like an audio backlog and the documentation as well. So if anyone would be interested in eventually contributing to our repositories, they can get up to speed in pretty much every single aspect of a lot of decisions that we made over the past year. And to explain on the country cards, right? So what is what defines rarity for country cards, right? And if we can just set the stage for what country cards is, then we can proceed with the first set of incentive mechanisms when we started introducing new types of cards and then we can also talk a bit about the the utility token as well yeah so um, about rarity there are different cards for each country because there are almost uh, 200 countries and so there are between three and 28, if I remember correctly, cards for each country, depending on the size of each country, the population of each country. So um, the first card of for each country is a diamond card with a specific design, a diamond border, and the other cards for a country are, are generic and, and are the same, have the same design. So, yeah. Quickly after releasing the country cards, we thought about a way to maintain some interest in the cards and to push people uh, to keep them and to have a good reason to keep their country cards. Because a big problem with NFT projects and, and collectible cards is that yeah, you could flip your cards anytime soon if you don't see any, any point in keeping them. So if you don't have any utility associated to your project, then the risk is that people just sell their cards. And, and so with the decreasing value, people get to be less interested in your project and then it dies out. So we thought, when I say we, I must admit that it's an idea for a member of the community. It's from Matteo, which was very active by the time. And 
we it was not the only one proposing some ideas. It was a, a really um, a really big strength of uh, the community to be able to submit new ideas and um, to think about new ways to improve the project. And so Matteo, at one point, had the idea of introducing an utility token and the possibility to use this token, which would be rewarded to cards owners in order to build cities, to create new cards, city cards, which would come uh, after the country cards. So um, the idea was to reward owners with the utility token with the AVT. At start, it was monthly. And you could also buy this AVT or trade it, in, of course, and then use it to, to have your own card, your city card for the city you wanted and by using the picture you wanted. So it added some community feature because people could get together to build their city, could choose together the, the pictures they wanted to use and um, so that was the idea to be able to make the community participate and to create their nfts in the series in in the algo world and and so that was in june or july i think the this new feature and uh, yes after after that uh, time it was countries, cities, and algorithm token, which was part of the. So, just to recap once again for the listeners, so what we just described was a continuation of how the project was changing and developing based on different ideas that were submitted from the community after the launch of the explorer that allowed people to basically trade their cards and list listings in a centralized manner we started getting a lot of interesting ideas on how the series could be expanded how the tokenomics for the project can be developed and once again none of this is a, like when we see utility token we really do imply an incentive mechanism to continue to incentivize people to play the game it's essentially a game for mm -hmm. collecting cards there's really nothing insidious to it you could think about baseball cards or cards that some people collect for pokemons or whatever for me personally and i'm sure for matt as well this was also a great learning experience just to through that integrating and slowly getting more and more Algorand L1 capabilities into the project and seeing how our community responds and then how essentially this can create some environment under which we will come up with new ideas to just continue building new incentives and, and, and growing the ecosystem basically. But at that point still, we didn't really have any anything strict in mind to plan for many years ahead. This was still pretty much something that we were doing mm -hmm. real time, which is getting and looking at the competition, this was a very competitive set of months as well, because as I said, a lot of generic marketplaces started popping up. And yeah, basically, there, there was a lot to uh, to look, look out for. And I'm slowly leading towards our uh, later decision making for the new roadmap. To expand on that, basically, as Matt just introduced the, the definitions for what the original the country cards meant to represent what the cities are. So with cities, everyone was able to submit new requests and use the utility token, the AWT, which, by the way, for those interested on the engineering side of things, is also the same abstraction in the L1, which is Algorand standard assets. The only difference between NFT and other assets such as tokens is the number of decimal okay. or yeah. number of floating points on which you can basically separate or split the assets or in other words supply yes and so another thing i've noticed is back then there was also a lot of sentiment for people to 
embrace a slightly more decentralized approach for how we were using the Explorer. And a lot of people want to see a use of smart contracts to, to make some additional aspects to that and introduce an ability to have bids, right? So you could place a bid mm. on your listing and then the highest bidder as in a regular auction gets the card or you can basically give it looking at the list of the highest bidders. Sometime starting June, we basically decided to let's go ahead and improve the Anvil implementation of V1. And I was lucky enough to find an open source implementation around that time from a Polish consulting firm called Ulam Labs. So they basically had a an implementation called Open NFT. You can check it out on GitHub. It's also available in the awesome Algo list, which is essentially a white label solution. They deployed to by default, the setup is full stack. Basically, you can clone the repository and with a minor set of updates, you have a generic auction marketplace. They use Vue.js for front end, they use Django for back end, Helm charts, and they deploy to Google Cloud. Unfortunately, though, I'm not sure about the current state of, of that particular project because they did rely on this thing called Algo Builder that was of a specific version before, I think, 2021. I think it was December 2019. And that version is a bit, um, it's not up to date to the latest SDK. So much things happened since then. So if you really want to rely on that marketplace, there is, you need to account to some learning curve. You would need to reverse engineer the solution and take the parts that you might find useful. And in my case, with the Algo World Explorer V2, the most useful part was, of course, the transpiled PyTeal auction contracts. So, unfortunately, Algo Builder didn't work out for me. The solution back then was basically to reuse the view front end. They had some of the parts from the Django backend, and well, we deployed the V2 by sometime in June, late, I believe it was closed to late June. And this is also, at that time, we also got the grant from the Algorand Scout program from Pablo from the RAND lab. So he was kind enough to provide this initial sort of grant to continue sponsoring the Algorand Explorer infrastructure. So this was the majority of funds that we used also for the for, of course, the hosting infrastructure, and then we use some of it for the pool, for the liquidity pool on Tinyman that was containing the token and etc. And essentially, in June, this was a very intense month. That's where majority of my experience came with stateful smart contracts. And so we had a modified version of the op open NFT smart contracts deployed. And an interesting thing happened. I think in a couple of days after the first release some of the members started noting that and there was a relatively i would say slow adoption in the very first couple of days and mm. people were still posting the the listings and the idea there was that when you make a listing with a particular card card you deploy your own stateful smart contract that is responsible for managing the auction just for your particular card. The second it transferred to another wallet, basically the same set of contracts are reused and you don't need to redeploy it every time. The first ever user to create a listing for a card that didn't have any contracts deployed for it before is the one who pays for the initial setup and then it just stays live on the chain and keeps transferring its functionality to different accounts. Um, so the interesting thing that happened is that there was a community member. Back then, he wasn't part of Algorand. Right now, I think he's part of the Algorand Inc. Actually, he works in the devel developer relations and uh, some of the people who actively participate in Discord on the Algorand Discord uh, may know him under username NoUN. And he was basically the one who found a few exploits in the ULAM Labs contracts that we basically used as a template. And essentially, the only modification point back then was 
changing the type of the asset that is used for payment. So Ulam Labs used USDC as a fixed asset. In our case, we switched them to, to, to Algo. And so Nolian was kind enough to supply the information on how this exploit can be reused. And this was an amazing learning opportunity for me to deal with the app development in general. When you have something that is immutable, you deployed it, you have a limited set of users already rely on it, but what do you do if you want to change and update it? Basically, we came up with a migration mechanism. So there was a migration mechanism introduced into V2. People could migrate to different versions mm -hmm. of the contracts and the exploit was pretty much patched in the in the next 24 hours after an UN actually reported it. And that was certainly a great learning opportunity. We did our due diligence as well and reported the bug to the original creators of the open NFT. So no worries on that. I think the latest version should be certainly safe to use. And that was the history for the V2 of the Explorer. Once again, to recap, we embraced some more feedback from the community. We implemented smart contracts based on the open NFT template, and we launched a new platform with deprecated Anvil that was rather centralized. And another perk was that users started getting access to one more integration at that point. So it was Algo Signer and the My Algo Wallet. With the V1, we only had access to Algo Signer. And with that, people started getting access to the auctions. And so for some of them, it actually ended up being a bit more interesting, I guess, or engaging because you, mm. it, with that capability, you basically do have access to observe every single transaction you do and transactions you signed, you signed that they were the, um, the mirror for you to understand how exactly the auctions were working and how the direct buy and sell transactions were working and etc. But all of that was once again operating on essential L1 capabilities of the Algorand chain and all of that was available in, in, in layer one. So we only had to deal with some additional centralization on top of that. There was a backup database and some workers running in the background. But once again, a lot of computation was also nicely outsourced to the chain itself, which is once again, a, one of the very big advantages for the app development in general, I think. Mm. And so for, I guess for the remaining set of months, we started then building more and more features on the V2 Explorer. One of the main differences again was a gallery view. So there was this map view, unfortunately, I will get later to that functionality again, but this gallery view basically was displaying a map and you could see a pens representing different countries and cities around the world under which there exists an Algo World card. And a cool thing with cities was the fact that every single city card was minted by some contribution from our community and some of them and the contributors Minting country cards when they spent AVT that they sort of accumulated and to create this card, they have an option to whether they want to choose the picture or not. Mm. And some of them are something that we choose if the user doesn't want to deal with that. But a cool thing with that gallery was the fact that you could see contributions with some of the pictures also being real life you know, pictures that just people taking on photos and it becomes something immutable on chain and becomes part of this collectible ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. That was and, a good, uh, good adding and a good strength of the project to be able to have the contributions of, of the members directly to create new accounts. And so to expand a bit on that, so now we're talking about the time frame from late June and let's say up until sometime in early September. Any chance you can also expand a bit on things that happen beyond the city and the country cards, such as uh, we also had some co collaboration cards called 
special series essentially yeah. um what was the the idea behind the special series cards and uh, yeah uh, is there anything in particular you'd like to highlight yeah so the idea behind the special cards was to have some links with other projects so we offered um, the possibility to to other projects to create special algo world cards related to the project with a specific design um it would be pure nfts with only one unit of of these cards and to then offer the, these cards to to the project and they could do whatever they wanted with it offer them to their community and the idea was to yeah bring some light to other projects for our community and to bring some light to our project and to other community and so to, to develop the links between the projects being built on algorand so we made some special cards for for fame for metapunks we also created a special card for decipher last year and the special card for decipher was exposed in the virtual gallery and also displayed in the showroom yes it was interesting to to have these special cards to to interact with other projects we can also talk about the treasure treasure hunts and the special games that we had in the community the idea as well was to bring some interesting features to the community for them to participate and to have some games around the cards so um, there there were some hidden willicks hidden in the halgo world and you had to find them by building the right city in the world and there there were some clues and if you managed to find the right city and to build it you could win the relic and then by having enough relics you could win some avt so yes there's also been specific treasure hunt and a big treasure hunt with different different uh, steps and people had to resolve the whole treasure hunt to to have a huge amount of avt so um, yeah support from collecting cards and building some new cities there was the idea of uh, of making games around around these cards uh, to to make uh, the community participate and having some fun games to to play with i see i see maybe just to expand a bit on that special cards collection roughly some around that time i think when the cipher was happening in uh, in miami if i recall it correctly this was april i'm sorry august august um, 2021 or it... yes i think it was around that time yeah or oh, the yeah. card itself i think this is something that we started doing before the actual conference i think the conference yeah. itself it was in october, october. Yeah. yeah but the card and the discussions already started around then with mm-hmm. from Algrand. and in regards to the in regards to the special cards once again for the listeners out there as you could see a lot of the mechanics and the incentive mechanisms and features were building on top of the ones that were already established before in, in many cases it was essentially trying to fulfill the goal to keep providing different sort of mechanics mm-hmm. For, mm-hmm. for the holders of the cards uh, to keep them engaged and uh, uh, also keeping the community aspect because i think this was also certainly a, a, a big advantage of the community because uh, there is there was a set and i mean there still is a, set, a very big set of enthusiasts in the ecosystem anyone could always join to uh, to learn more about 
our grant in general about the project and the different things and the incentive mechanisms. And I also wanted to outline the fact that we, and in my case, I was also pushing a lot towards establishing a, a, a common pattern in regards to the visual appeal, right? So we established this a very specific set of guidelines that we followed in regards mm. to how cards are done. We read it, the logo, we read it, the color scheme, and then we also had the landing page that I did in the in this static site generator called Hugo. So if you go to algaworld.io, this is something that we also launched, I think, also early June, right? Sometime oh, in, yeah, I think it was sometime in June. June. Yeah. And so the algaworld.io site was basically the main entry point for the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So you could read the white paper. In there, you could read the latest roadmap. You could have the links to different series of cards. And there's a set of blocks that also nicely highlights uh, the evolution and things that changed and things that were added or deprecated and etc. So if you really want to learn more about the things that were happening, feel free to go ahead to that site. And from there, it's an entry point. You could get to the different platforms such as the latest open source version of Explorer and we'll get back to it very soon. And of course, the Swapper. Roughly sometime in August, also just to highlight for the sake of completeness, uh, Roughly sometime in August, we also collaborated with the folks from the Elkrant Mobile Wallet team. This was back before this was the Pearl Wallet, renamed to the Pearl Wallet. We also had one of the first integrations of the Wallet Connect. So this was also a nice experience. And I think a lot of things piled up by autumn. We had the tournament launch, so the token finally had it. We had its own liquidity pool. Then we essentially had the Decipher conference. And uh, at that point, I think pretty much a lot of generic platforms already established uh, the mainnet and the initial releases. I think mm -hmm. by early September, we already had Run Gallery was flourishing. We had AB2 Gallery. We had um, things like NFT Explorer. I think it was already released in the first iterations back then mm. we had uh, algo gems was in testnet i think and algo x nft as well right so as you can mm. see over this very short time span the amount of different things that started popping up and competing was within the ecosystem for this sort of spot for a marketplace for generic algo and standard asset was already very impressive so the, as time went on, we were scoping more and more things specifically for the project once again because we really didn't want to compete and we didn't have the capacity to compete, right? We, it was only myself and Matt responsible for a lot of things on the, in, in regards to the platforms and the community. There was a lot of decision-making done too, like how we can continue coming up with something interesting for the community to continue incentivizing them but at the same time not not to do something overly ambitious that we can't mm -hmm. uh, essentially allocate ourselves into and this is uh, sometime around that span we had this idea about the swapper and i'll cover a, a bit more technical details there but any chance you could give like the first outline for uh, for the swapper and how the what was the initial use case for it? Yes, the idea of the swapper is linked to the genesis of the project because we are talking about collectible cards, and so the first feature that you are thinking about when you think about cards is the way to trade them efficiently and in a secure way. So um, I remember Ray and Fox from Algorand uh, having first draft of a swapper back in June or May or June. And he also made a 
a little. Uh, he broadcasted something about. Uh, I, I think it uh, was this uh, on Dev Office Hours, and he yes. made an example of a mm -hmm. uh, stateless smart signature with reach. I think. Yeah. Or Python, or something like that. But yeah, go ahead. something like that. Yeah, but he had this first version, this first ID, and uh, we all had this in the corner of our heads, and to have this possibility to swap cards to be able to do that and not only sell and buy cards but also trade them which is the essence of a collectible card game and so um, at one point you had some time to dedicate to this feature Al, and you started creating it using your smart contracts and it uh, it was like the final feature allowing to to have a everything needed to play around with the cards, the possibility to, to sell them, to, to buy them, and to trade them. And you also opened this swapper to every other. So it was not only for Algorand cards. The idea was to propose a tool, a generic tool, which would bring also people to Algorand by offering the possibility to use this tool for something else mm -hmm. than algorithm counts. And so for the listeners out there, as Matt is outlining, as you can hear, there was a set of certain mechanisms and incentives in place, and we have been operating on them manually for a significant part of the first, first two quarters of 2021. And the goal with the Explorer, Explorer was slowly adding more and more capabilities that were automating things like city packs. City packs, I think, was the main use case as well for the swapper. And when we say swapper, um, there is a few, two terminologies. One is, uh, well, uh, stateless smart contracts. And Delgrand renamed that uh, term, I think, sometime Last year, they called them uh, smart signatures now. So it's essentially in contrast with uh, stateful contracts. Once again, you don't need to deal with state. You uh, There's different ways on how you can deploy a, a smart signature. One that the Algo World Swapper relied on is an escrow account, which essentially embeds a teal logic that approves atomic transactions. So in order to interact with that particular account, you need to issue atomic transactions. And that is also where the notion of a swap happens because you have a single atomic group where you have a sender sending the N amount that is required for, for the receiver. Receiver in this case could be the, the seller of the, of the card. And then Basically, in the same group, you also get the transactions that send the the cards itself to the person who wants to buy them from the escrow, and that escrow is set up for the person who wants to sell them. So, smart signature essentially eliminates the need for you to deal with, and of course, it is useful and makes sense only in cases when you don't need to deal with state and just uh, something that takes into the consideration because. Uh, dealing with stateful smart contracts in general could be something that requires a lot of very thorough reviews and compliance in regards to how secure it is. Smart signatures for me was also a way to have this very simple set of assert assertions in PyTeal and uh, it's easier to deal with security in that case because it's when you have 100 lines of code to deal with, it's really easy to have a very thorough testing for it. So that's why we went ahead with smart signatures, basically. And this was the first capability for on the Explorer that wasn't tied to a particular series of cards. It allowed for ASA, by ASA, I mean Algorand Standard Asset, to Algorand Standard Asset uh, transactions. And of course, you could do ASA to multi-ASA transactions and vice versa with Algo. So 
A huge shout out to, of course, Kosim Basi for that, because he helped a lot with the implementation of the initial contracts in PyTeal. The contracts itself are open source. So it was one of the first pieces of code we open source completely. So it's open source on GitHub available under MIT. The contracts are tested using GitHub Actions. We spin up a sandbox Algorand node every time, and we use PyTest pretty plain setup, just PyTeal, PyTest, and that's pretty much everything in regards to what you need if you want to set up and contribute something to the repo. So this was one of the first things we open source. It's also available on PyPy, distributed as a package. You can also install it using pip install world contracts if you want to have a simple smart signature based swapping functionality in your project. And Swapper came as a feature on Explorer. And at that point, we pretty much realized that it grew to a pretty big extent, right? The platform hosted this uh, partially centralized uh, infrastructure. We had smart signatures. We had smart contracts with auctions. We had the gallery. We had a lot of background processes that were also updating the holders, information on different cards, and etc. It basically acted as an actual explorer, except for the fact that we were limited to just algo world cards. So... This is probably sometime in, I think, starting from August last year, after the Swapper was also launched initially on the V2 Explorer. As part of the Explorer, we started thinking on what are the actual next steps. And the big prerequisite for the actual next steps was the communication with the borderless capital as well. So I would give Matt a stage once again to expand a little bit on that because this was a, a major point in our decision making in regards to hmm. well, how do we continue evolving this thing and once again this was a time when we realized that uh, the platforms that we built have, have grown over the extent of just two people who can maintain it in, in free time Yeah, so basically we got reached out by uh, David uh, Garcia from Borderless Capital and there was an opportunity for us to attend in the accelerator. So if you could just add a few notes on that, Matt. Yeah, we've been contacted by Borderless, as you said, and by David. And uh, yeah, so the idea was to present our project to present our roadmap and to show what we could do with the project but yes i think we so we presented everything and it was interesting to have this this presentation and to have this chat with david but yes it was predictable i think that um, if you want to develop and if you want to grow and to be supported by uh, by uh, by a company, you have to dedicate fully to your project, and it is what they wanted from us to to fully dedicate to our project and to leave our jobs to dedicate fully to Algo World and. Uh, so it was a step that we didn't want to to take because for my personal case, we were waiting a new baby, a new child with my wife, and I love my job, my current job, and so I wasn't ready to to quit my job to to fully dedicate to, to Algo World. So at this point, we didn't follow this accelerator program yeah, and we decided to, to kind of migrate to an open source project and to like give the project to the community in a way because after open sourcing the project, everybody could build and improve, improve it. So um, yes, that's the direction we we took after after discussing with Borderless. Yeah. So I just wanted to give my take as well. 
I feel like up till that meeting we had, we basically just wanted to see how far we can go with this, right? Mm -hmm. Just wanted to see how far we can continue implementing something new and basically collaborating with other folks in the ecosystem or seeing if if there's other ways for us to uh, get some resources to continue developing on this. But that was the tipping point at some point. In some sense, there were many factors, and as Matt outlined, I think both of us weren't just ready for that significant drastic change in, in, in the way we deal with this project. In my case as well, I think, I'm sure in Matt's as well, a big um, drive to continue getting back to it and working on this as a hobby was basically just the interaction with the community. Interaction with the community, getting the, uh, once again, this sort of live feedback, right? When you plan something ahead, plan on some interesting feature that allows you to both help or satisfy the community and at the same time learn something in regards to L1 capabilities of Algorand mm. or some latest features that were coming out almost every couple of months in Teal. I think over the span of the year, we also saw Teal going from Teal two to pretty much till i think the latest is six or seven and a lot of cool things were introduced basically at some point it just became too big so we couldn't allocate enough time to staying on top of those new things that were being introduced by algorand and trying to integrate them into algo world jumping into it full time wasn't also an option and basically we started thinking with matt on what can we do next? How can we make it such that the future roadmap is not going to be fully dependent on both of us in this particular case? And given our experience with by then myself open sourcing the algorithm contracts and collaborating a lot with Cosimo, I realized the potential advantage in, in, in just, well, open sourcing the entire thing for free to everyone so that you can fork, clone it, or if you really like the Algorand ecosystem itself and the project and the community, you can become a member, contribute to it, and basically directly participate in the actual evolution of the project and not and this thing not being fully dependent on us. I think the next chunk is going to be rather simplified because there wasn't a lot of, I would say, implementation related things that were being added but sometimes since end of 2021 we basically came up with a new roadmap and that new roadmap was designed around open sourcing explorer v2 and with that gig became a very big challenge because essentially there was a lot of different capabilities on that platform it was centralized i wanted to reduce costs ideally to zero so that there would be any need for neither myself, Matt, or the community to spend any resources to, to host it. And uh, that that's where, once again, on-chain, relying on, on on-chain data and relying on different Web3 infrastructures, like IPFS came very handy. So the majority of the remaining month, I would suppose, leading to Let's say from September, from December 2021 up until September this year. So it's a big time frame. There was a lot of, I would say, continuation and just community interacting with the platforms. And I also would like to highlight one additional thing that there was and still is a special manual auction that is uh, done by uh, the member of our community. And big shout out to for, for, for him to uh, basically organizing it and uh, a tiny philosopher yeah, yeah the ti ti tiny philosopher sorry for that. i was looking for the exact username I wasn't sure if it's really but he's an active member on the telegram community he hosts the charity auctions and actually under charity auctions sometime last year we were able to gather i think this was around january and yeah, this was more than one thousand algos January this year, basically, yeah, yeah, there was around a thousand and two fifty mm. algos that we've committed to children's, children's, uh, children's yeah. yeah research hospital dedicated yeah. to cancer research for kids. A lot of things like that are, are still going in the community, and 
the certain set of funds are always outlined towards some charities or greater good. And so to outline the history of what happened afterwards, right? So we were set on a goal to open source the whole thing. I started reviewing the features that were most used on the Explorer V2. The first thing that came in mind is the Swapper. Swapper was a generic platform. It allowed any asset to asset transaction. So it wasn't directly tied to Alga World Explorer itself. This was something that was split as a first capability. So basically sometime in June, this year, we split the swapper. So currently it's in V3 iteration. And once again, it was completely written from scratch. This time, not relying on the open NFT template. So the latest swapper is essentially, you could see a pretty detailed documentation if you go at docs.algorold.io that I'm currently updating on a bi-weekly basis. A swapper is free. I host it on Vercel. It's available. I believe under either MIT or some very restrictive, non-restrictive open source license. You can look it up on github.com at AlgaWorldNFT org. And basically, Swapper was revamped to, to to rely on mostly on chain data. So we use IPFS now. For storing the swap configurations, we have the public swaps features exported from V2, and people can essentially expose their escrow accounts that they create for selling. So think of it as a, once again, a listing page. The main difference, once again, with the V2 is that it's no longer a very centralized code base, and there's a lot of reliance on chain data, and it costs zero for hosting and for actually keeping it alive. So entire code base is open source, relies on the contracts that are also open source. Anyone is free to basically commit and contribute. And if you actually want to learn something about the project, or if you, let's say, you want to create your own swapper, uh, I'm always happy to yeah, give a few advices there because I'm still continuing to, of course, improve the platform and uh, Given the capacity of developing this myself, there's a lot of room for refactoring, of course, but I think it's certainly in a better spot than it was in the original Explorer iteration. And it also has end-to-end -end tests, so every time a new feature is developed, there's actual simulation for user interaction that goes through entire swapper flow and simulates a typical process of creating an escrow yeah. account, creating a public escrow account, and etc. And uh, well, and Matt, uh, I know I'm going a bit too fast now because uh, just for the sake of time, I don't want to yeah. go over time on your side. And uh, that was a relatively, I would say, boring set of months. We had a very specific thing in mind. We realized that we want to open source it. So it was just from my side, it was a lot of uh, testing and to end testing, unit testing, and just. Uh, Refactoring, we're getting rid of that initial V2 code base. If, if you want to add anything in, in, into that time frame, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, I'll continue on this sort of the final set of months that happened before this episode and when we open source the Explorer as well. Yeah, sure. Nothing specific, as you said, as a charity auctions continued in the community and that, that's great to be able to continue this after all, all these months and uh, people are still able to getting rewards and have the possibility to build cities and even if we are not the excitement the rush of the first month so the, the project is is continuing and uh, Things go on in the community, and that's that's nice to show that we can hold and maintain an NFT project for several months, and even almost several years. We could see in the community, in the Algorand community projects, 
work pulling after a few weeks or a few months. And so it's cool to have a, a project continuing of this month and to, to have community still, uh, still uh, participating and couldn't thank enough all the community members for being part of this project and and giving us the, the motivation to to continue and to improve our world. Yeah, I, I would certainly double that from my side. Uh, the biggest sort of source of inspiration was once again just looking at the responses and the things happening in the community unfortunately i was always busy with just implementing something so i wasn't mm -hmm. usually an active participant of the community itself but i certainly was always an active observer and trying to reflect the the trends and needs that the community would express in the the in the in the newest iterations and so with that i guess Let's lead to the final chunk. Basically, the months starting from June up till September. After Swappers was open sourced, we also came to another set of realizations with Matt by reviewing the most used features and capabilities on V2. So fortunately, things like gallery and the auction-based contracts ended up being a bit too hard to maintain. Primary reasons for the gallery, which, by the way, is still has a chance to be re-implemented or added to the latest version of explorer was simply the hosting infrastructure because we had to pull the latest data for the geolocation of the city so whenever matt creates a new city and new user creates a new, and mints a new city explorer v2 would need to run a backup background process identify that new card being added to the database that then would need to fetch and find information about the about the coordinates of that city and, and persisted. One of the things is was basically just a lot of background processing that was uh, that was done for identifying the location, and it was least actively used feature. So we kind of ha decided to um, essentially instead of open sourcing the open NFT based template, uh, I decided to rewrite it. Uh, and base it on the swapper that was at that point fully done from scratch uh, using um, Next.js hosted on Vercel, etc. So Explorer v2 started being deprecated. We announced the information that the existing offshore contracts are about to be not not fully deprecated. They will stay on chain. It's just that after December this year, we'll probably close the the hosting infrastructure back then and there will be a manual on-demand basis process for users who still have their assets on those contracts to close them down either there will be a process on the latest explorer or there will be um, some sort of migration tool that i'll add sometime early next year for that in case there would be still auctions on the explorer v2 so we decided to basically get rid of the stateful contracts as well once again some of the users were upset about that, but I think the justification in this case is essentially the complexity of maintaining this code base. And this certainly doesn't eliminate the fact that if a greater need arises once again, we can always find perhaps a smart signature based option for the contracts or something that is relatively manageable in regards to having this within the open source scope. So with those two things in place, we essentially committed and I started with the final open sourcing step and we released Algo World Explorer V3 in September last month. And V3 is essentially, once again, we optimized for reducing the cost of the hosting infrastructure and reducing the amount of the data that is centralized in some sense so basically now it relies completely on a single set of background jobs happening on github as well and most of the data comes once again from either apfs or it comes from a fixed fixed set of statically updated 
JSON files that contained information about cards. So it's insanely simplified in comparison to the original implementation, I would say. And the main things that we kept committed to is the gallery view. So you could still browse any card if you want a truthful source, a source for whether you know your open and uh, your NFT is actual Algo World NFT. It is always a matter of just going to explore the Algo World Dio and verifying whether that's in a list if you want to verify the legitimacy of the card. And then a set of additional capabilities includes on the Explorer ability to get the packs and ability to increase the influence of the cities. So, oh, I think we oh, yeah, forgot yeah. to. <laughs> uh, to <laughs> you didn't talk about that. <laughs> to mention that, but I'll give Matt a word for it. And just to close down on the open sourcing efforts, um, at this point, we have the Explorer and the Swapper open source at some point, but we'll also open source the, even the, the, the landing page that we have after some refactoring work being done there. And basically, if there is anyone interested from Algorithm community or Algorithm ecosystem in general to contribute to either a generic smart signature based swapper or a generic uh, explorer tool that is, I guess, programmatically limiting its scope to a specific NFT series, I'm more than happy to supply some additional information with that. You can use it as a template as well for any of your projects. And essentially, if you need some supervision and want to really commit to implementing new features, we can also consider splitting certain amount of incentive if you are about to do a significant contribution, essentially. But at this point, myself and Matt, we the only source of additional direct incentives that we receive is by selling the packs that we have on the Explorer. But everything else it was automated towards benefiting the community itself. For example, using the swapper directly affects the size of the liquidity in our ABT algo pool because basically the uh, the fees aggregated from there that the swapper gets after each swap transaction, they all are directly contributed to the AVT liquidity pool. We don't get any incentive from that. As creators, it all goes towards the pool, in this case, and the liquidity. And then, yes, there's also the manual charity auctions, as we mentioned. So, yeah, the only direct source that we currently receive is just the, the packs. If you want to support the project, that is probably the only direct way to do so. Everything else is, of course, benefiting the community members as well. Um, so yeah, I guess in regards to the open sourcing ecosystem, this was a long journey. It took the same amount of months that it took for us to actually more month to open source it than to develop the initial implementations. But I think if you would like to contribute, I'm more than happy once again. The documentation available at docs.algoworld.io. And at this point, we don't control or enforce anything in regards to those platforms because it's fully available on GitHub. And uh, any changes that we're about to do in future will primarily be based around improving the performance, improving the code base, and etc. And if a big initiative comes in for from the community, I would be more than happy to help someone contribute and uh, continue evolving. And so essentially, yeah, we did all of this just so that it can last. It won't spend any hosting infrastructure resources and can serve as a good learning environment for folks who are interested in decentralized app development. And yeah, Matt, if you can... If you want to fill on the on the influence deposit capability, and once again, for some listeners, it might go uh, the information might be a bit scattered. Uh, but if you really want to get up to speed in regards to all of these incentive things, we have the white paper available on the algorithm.io website. So if you are interested in all those incentives, and once again, this is all essentially designed to have 
additional interest for people to play this game, which is basically gathering collectible cards. So the, mm. the, a, a lot of my own personal friends were also being confused about the uh, the goals for the project and etc. But if you frame it like this, it is essentially a very simple collectible thing. Like it's uh, the simplicity here actually causes a lot of complexity <laughs> for yeah. some people. But uh, yeah, if you want to go into that, otherwise I think we pretty much covered most of the history that happened with the project and leading mm. to us open sourcing it. So I guess this episode also says a a way to pass the torch for the community, especially the world community. And if there's any developers out there, once again, I think the, a lot of work has been done basically to provide this code base for free to everyone. Would be more than happy to see this thing continue evolving. Um, up to you, Matt. If you want to cover anything in regards to the city influence, let me know. Otherwise, we can dig into the final question. For the yes, uh, I can say a small word about city influence. It's it's a small feature to to use AVT to improve the city cards and to add some points to each city. So we benefit from ARC 69 feature, which offers the possibility to add some traits to NFTs. And so city influence is just a number, but you can upgrade and improve that number by spending AVT. And the higher the influence, the higher the rewards you get for your city cards. So if you if you have a high influence city, first you get more AVT each week, and second you can pretend to be to have the city capital because the Algorand capital is the city with the highest influence. On top of all the features we mentioned. This is another little game, little features that we added to to maintain the interest in the cards and to differentiate the different city, the different cities in the algo world because you have diamond cities or regular cities. All right, and yeah, as I mentioned. This is actually not a manual mechanism, mm -hmm. anymore, right? People can actually inter interact with it. It's fully automated on the explorer.algorold.io and it stores most of the information on chain. There's an easy way to also obtain it, even if you don't have access to the, to the client itself. So giving all that and uh, I guess covering the majority of things that happened, I actually have one more question before the final question. And I just want to play the role of a of a user of the algo community, right? Well, what in your opinion is a good s sort of uh, path towards which this open source ecosystem can continue evolving uh, starting from sometime next year, basically? If you had a an ability to directly influence further development or set particular roadmap for things that we would like people to commit or contribute, mm -hmm. what do you think is a, is a good logical next step for for us, considering the fact that now we have everything open source? Uh, I. I don't say that it's easy, but one thing that would be great would be to add some features to the Explorer to add some utility to the AVT, to the Algor token, because now we can use AVT to, to upgrade influence or to build new cities. But I think a great addition would be to have 
more features and more things to do directly on the explorer with some AVT. So I was thinking about creating some generic world by by building a little blocks on a map and to build a, a world with AVT that would be like a community thing. Everybody could build their part of this world and by using AVT. I, I think there are a lot of ideas that could be brought and to, to use AVT. So that's an idea. Maybe try to add some features to the Explorer to be able to spend AVT and to create something with this AVT. But so that's an idea, and I'm sure there are a lot of different things to do with the Explorer, and that could be nice uh, as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I would agree that increasingly... Because it, it's called utility, right? So mm. It's actually utility for, for, for the use. I guess one, one additional thing that we could add is just an alternative way to to pay the fees for the swaps for example we could say a smaller a smaller fee basically for for those who would like to pay for the swap in in awt or etc but yeah i certainly would agree that increasing the at least a couple of more additional ways to 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 use the avt would certainly be nice for the community because i think at this point we do have a lot of people's or the old school members of the community who have a lot of awt mm -hmm. and they, there's only so many things that they can do with it at this point yeah after building 10 or more cities maybe you want to make something else with your awt so it could be a good addition yeah and despite myself saying that I won't be active in regards to contributions, I would still allocate some time on on monthly or biweekly basis to continue improving the test, continue improving mm -hmm. the documentation, etc. But yeah, certainly a few additional things on my backlog that I will improve. And I I think adding a different payment method for the contracts and different types of because right now I think you can do multi-asset or algo, but you can mm -hmm. do it vice versa. So I'll add those things as well. But for any radical new feature, I think this is something that might come after we will finalize all the documentation and and the onboarding guidelines, etc. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think certainly a lot of flexibility with the code base that is open source, I think we'll just continue building. I'd say continue uh, contributing to the code base because there's no longer this hard pressure on having something new being added, and it costs nothing for our ourselves and our community to have this mm. thing running. I think we're certainly in a better place compared to this uh, uncertain time period last year. We were still unsure on where yeah. this goes, and we're just trying to stay stay afloat, competing with different generic platforms and etc. Yeah, it was a crazy journey. As a tradition that happens with this podcast already, is I usually finalize the episodes with a question in regards to advices to aspiring software engineers or people who would just like to try hands on the blockchain development, whether it's Algorand or any Web3 related technology. Any particular advices that you would give to people who are eager to explore, but are not sure where to start, basically? Mm. I don't have much experience with other blockchains, but what I can say is that Algorand was super easy to use and to build them. So I would say find the blockchain you're comfortable with and go ahead to 
explore what you can do with it. And, uh, and to me, it was Algorand because I know Python. If you know Python as well or JavaScript, there is a lot of documentation on the official website. So my main advice would be to go ahead. If you want to build something on the blockchain, now is the time you can just do whatever you want because we are still early and there are a lot of things to do and to propose. It's a very open world and community. You won't be rejected or anything if you propose something new. I would say everything can be done right now. Even if you don't have very high skills in coding, I think you can find some, some things to do and some, some projects to develop. So even if it's just for fun, it's a nice experience to, to build on, on the blockchain right now. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the insights, Matt closing notes from my side as well i completely agree with that i think like we've been speaking a lot about nfts in this episode and rightly so because it's dedicated specifically to the algo world this time but there's just so much more applications that you can find for, for blockchains maybe one additional thing i would add to matt's advice is when doing this research and finding a chain that suits you i think it's also important to uh, to do your research in regards to the consensus mechanism as well to understand how the consensus ties in in regards to things like availability scalability security how decentralized the network is and perhaps if you dig a bit deeper into particular implementations of the consensus right now there's in case of Algorand, it's a Byzantine agreement that is a modified version of a Byzantine agreement that Algorand implemented, and they have no forks, and they essentially don't have an issue of putting a, an economic incentive on compute power, which I think inherently is, is a great advantage because we live in a world where there's a finite set of resources and you can't really account to i think proof of work in this case but without going too deep into that i think in the upcoming episodes we will also have some interesting guests to talk about state proofs i might have some time to schedule a conversation with brian fox from the algorand devrel to talk about state proofs on l1 and what are they and discuss some high level terminology of the on the exotic cryptography that they use such as the digital the falcon digital digital signature algorithm etc and this thursday unless rescheduled there was there's also going to be a deep dive into the nfd platform and we will have a chat with patrick bennett from nfd to talk about his journey into Algorand, and we'll see how deep we can dive in regards to the implementation details. But I'll, I'll do my best to not to keep it overfloated with different terminologies that are a bit confusing for people not coming from Web3 backgrounds and etc. With that, I know we went over time with you, Matt. So hopefully, no issues in regards to that. But once again, it was a very special episode. I think certainly less prepared in that sense. Myself and Matt, we had, we still do have weekly calls basically, and always trying to be up to speed with what's going on in the community and implementing and discussing new things for the roadmap. But the, the, this phase is slowly wrapping up as we finish the open sourcing efforts mm. we'll see how it will continue evolving but uh, if there would be a core chunk of contributors at some point it, like my end goal for it is to basically 
if this is possible at some point to get back to that stage when we were dealing with the early days and there was a lot of direct engagement and then feedback in regards to things that could be changed or added. And I think this was the most exciting period in the project's history so far. And funnily enough, it was the less, like the sort of least formal or serious period, right? Because there was just a lot of exploration, a lot of learning done. And uh, yeah, I think it certainly served as a great platform for just getting familiar with Algorand in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It certainly has a lot opportunity, a lot of opportunities to continue learning new things about Algorand, I think. We'll see. Lots of exciting things to come. And uh, when time allows, I think uh, I'm certainly not going to disappear from the ecosystem. I still do have a lot of personal ties to this project. And uh, when my time allows, I will certainly continue contributing and improving the code base. Uh, but yeah, Matt, back to you. Any closing notes or closing thoughts? in regards to the project history overall or anything you'd like to outline before we finish? Yeah, as you said, it was a crazy journey. It's not over yet. We continue, but as you said, also it will be a more quiet path now. So, yeah, we'll see what the future will bring. And I hope that we will have some contributions to the Explorer to improve it and to add new features. I think I'll try myself also to to bring back the, the energy of the early days when I just wanted to create something new. So maybe I, I'll try something with the Explorer and to see what I can do, even if I have only basic skills to to see what I can create with it. So it's not over with, with Algo World and, uh, and Algorand in general. So I'm very confident with uh, the future of, of Algorand. It's been yeah, a little bit rough these times, um, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Algorand is here to stay. And uh, if we can continue to build on it, uh, it, will be, it will be perfect. And um, yeah, thank you, Al, also to to have been part of this journey. You had no no obligation at all to, to help him at start, and so you did so much to improve the project. So, so, so that was really amazing, and I couldn't thank you enough for that. So, yeah, appreciate you. it, Matt. Thank you. It certainly, was a great experience. I guess with that, we pretty much covered the majority of the episode. We promised an Ask Me Anything section at the very end. I did just double check the Telegram channel. And rightfully, once again, apologizing to the community, we haven't really planned this to be live. Yeah. This is just a very random thing that happened at the very, uh, uh, a few minutes before we basically started. So I think people were just uh, certainly not committed because we didn't announce it beforehand but uh, as a final question if you'd like to see more live episodes for the podcast actually uh, stream directly to the twitter channel and uh, youtube integration will come soon as well well let us know you can reach reach out to me on algo world twitter or awesome algo twitter or there is a link under the threads under which you're currently looking at the stream to the algo world community to which you can essentially join and that's where you can find myself as well if you would like to see more live episodes in future just let me know this would be a great opportunity to ask any questions that you may have and in real time and get responses from myself and the guest as well once again Thank you for listening to this uh, very casual, I would say, episode or uh, seven. We did it. We did this live. It's going to become available on the streaming platforms 
sometime soon in the coming hours and i uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, i hope this will serve as a good reference to what algo world is in general and uh, next time someone asks we can just say listen to this chunk <laughs> all right matt thanks again for uh, coming up with this idea uh, thank you Al. and uh, yeah thanks thanks for listening Thank uh...